Today, I'm going to do a book review of a book called Knowledge and Christian Belief by Alan Plantinga. Plantinga. I hope that pronounced that right. So I was given this book by a Christian friend of mine maybe a decade ago um, when I was starting to lose my religion. Um, so I read it when I was still, I guess you could uh, call a liberal Christian. Um, and so it was a, a logical move. And I was very interested in reading this book because I thought, well, maybe you know this will uh, convince me to... Uh, stick with the religion, um, especially since Alvin Plantinga, he's considered to be one of the best living apologists, um, and I think he's retired now, but he spent many years of his um, career uh, at a position at Notre Dame University, where he was basically trying to convince smart people that Christianity uh, wasn't as absurd as it appears on the surface. So at the time, I wrote up the critique on the book, um, uh, and then I returned it to my friend, um, who had given me the book only to find that he himself had not actually read the book, which I thought was uh, rather interesting, as I never recommend a book that I have not read. Um, I think it's likely that my friend had probably heard Alvin Plantinga on YouTube um, and thought that it might sway me back into the fold of the faithful. Needless to say, I found the book less than convincing. And when I realized the uh, sophistry and the intellectual dishonesty that Plantinga regularly uses in his book— it actually inched me further away from a, a theistic belief. So in this book, Knowledge of Christian Belief, um, philosopher Alvin Plantinga, he presents a comprehensive exploration of the relationship between knowledge and religious belief, particularly focusing on Christian belief. He offers several arguments to support um, the compatibility of religious beliefs, specifically uh, uh, their compatibility with rationality and knowledge. So overall, the book aims to demonstrate that Christian belief is not irrational or incompatible with knowledge. He contends that religious belief can be rational and justified, even if they do not adhere to the same evidentiary standards as empirical claims. Um, and he uses this by using a framework of proper function and foundational beliefs. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through the first couple of chapters with you um, to demonstrate the kinds of um, techniques, techniques, uh, dare I say, cheap tricks that are used, um, and they're characteristic of, of the, the book. So he begins this book with the statement that he's dealing with the question of, quote, justification or rationality or reasonableness of holding Christian belief. And this seems like a good place to start the book on apologetics. However, um, as we uh, shall soon see, he um, decides to narrowly focus on very specific objections. So the first chapter is, can we think and speak about Christian belief? So in this first chapter, he, said, he uh, uh, states that they're dealing with the question of, quote, is there such a thing as Christian belief? However, the author conveniently does not deal with this question. He instead tries to argue with, quote, can we even discuss the concept of an ultimate God? This is important as it betrays the intellectual dishonesty uh, of the entire book. The position is that there is uh, that there is no such thing as a Christian belief is an absurd point that no atheist contends. Rather than staying with his initial stated topic, he dances to the topic of can we as limited human beings even discuss the topic of an unlimited God? Here again, it's intellectually dishonest in that he presents a false alternative. He presents the option that we either can talk about God or we cannot talk about God, but that, but uh, in reality, there's another option that he does not take into consideration, which is the fact is the right answer, in that we have no evidentiary basis on which to talk about God. If the author were intellectually honest, he would instead tackle the topic of whether we have enough reliable information to talk about God, or are we just making things up? The answer to this first stated topic is Obviously, yes. So we could think and speak about Christian belief. We can speak and talk about the beliefs of other uh, religions, such as the Mormon church. But this does not in and of itself give any validity to anything that Mormonism teaches or anything that Christianity teaches. And the answer to the second question of whether that we can talk about the concept of an ultimate God is also probably yes. But it needs to add the qualifier that discussion needs to be evidence-based. Um, I think, in order to have any value whatsoever. Okay, so chapter two. Now, what's interesting is is that 
I do not disagree with the conclusions of this chapter. And I think that should be taken as a statement of weakness for a book on apologetics. If an atheist can read a chapter and not disagree with any of the conclusions uh, without changing his views on God. It shows that the author has wasted the reader's time by making arguments that are not real arguments. So the main defect with this chapter is that the author attempts to define the debate by a narrow mischaracterization of a side argument. On uh, the point of his narrow mischaracterization, I agree with him. The author divides the objections to Christianity as de facto and de jure. The author defines de facto as the de facto objector therefore argues that Christian belief is false or at least very improbable, which is kind of where I think I would fall. The author then goes on to define de jure objections as, quote, the claim is not that a belief is false, although of course it might be. The claim, rather, is that it displays some other defect. It is immoral or irrational or foolish or unjustified or in some other way deficient, end quote. He then spends the rest of the chapter analyzing the de jure objections while completely disregarding the de facto objections. This again, I feel, is intellectually dishonest because you cannot argue de jure without first looking at de facto. So again, I'm going to use Mormonism as an example because I think this is perfectly illustrates how this argument makes no sense whatsoever. The traditional Mormon belief is, uh, that polygamy is encouraged by divinity uh, and has something to do with populating worlds in an afterlife cannot be deemed immoral, irrational, or foolish, or unjustified if uh, it was uh, legitimately the words of God. So under the God hypothesis, God makes the rules of morality. So if a Mormon could prove to me that God really did give the instructions about polygamy, then as much as I personally uh, think that polygamy is disgusting, um, I would have to see the point to the Mormons. So if God, or God, if he exists, would always have the ultimate say about what is immoral, irrational, and justified. The key words in this last sentence is, if he exists. If the Christian God exists, then of course it would be immoral, irrational, foolish, or unjustified. It, it would not be uh, immoral, irrational, foolish, or unjustified to hold Christian beliefs. I also think that this chapter is a straw man in that he looks at the arguments of Freud and Marx as somehow representative of atheist viewpoint. Marx, in my opinion, was spectacularly wrong on his theories of human nature and economics. And to hold him up as a champion of the atheist cause, I feel, is disingenuous. Um, to hold up Marx as a typical atheist would be the same as if I were to hold up the Reverend Jim Jones as a, typ as a typical theist. Both continue to have large followings, but both are outliers in the modern discussion of the God hypothesis. The author even states at the bottom of page 20, quote, Marx does not have a great deal to say about religion. And I wrote in the margin then, why bring him up at all? I think it's basically the reason he brought him up is because he knows that most Americans are going to have a natural revulsion to Marx due to our uh, anti-communism, which is relatively prevalent in American culture. So if he can somehow associate uh, atheism with this evil specter of communism, then, you know, it, it, it's a straw man, basically. And uh, so anyways, um, so atheism, it's defined as a lack of belief in God. So atheism by its nature is not revealed or dependent upon the understanding of certain books or scriptures, right? The lack of a belief in God can arise spontaneously when an individual decides to analyze the God hypothesis. There's no need for anybody on their journey to atheism to consider anything that Karl Marx may have written. Just like um, no one on their journey um, to theism uh, needs to read the Book of Mormon. And I give my... So that gives you a flavor for the kinds of sophistries that Plantica engages in. In my opinion, I would recommend this book if you want to see a world-class apologetic tap dance routine. If you consider uh, it the job of an apologist to try and make money selling books that make people feel good about religious beliefs that they had uh, arrived at prior to reading the book, then this book does what it needs to do. But 
if it's not that, if that's not your thing, then I would recommend that you put it in the blue recycling bin so that it could be turned into something more useful the next time around. Overall, I would not recommend this book.